Hey friends, welcome back. So in today's show, we're going to talk more about the connections between sugar, sugar consumption, and cancer, specifically honing in on breast, lung, colon, and brain cancer, as these cancer subtypes have been linked with deranged cellular metabolism and talk more about the Warburg effect and exactly what this is. Some recent updates with regards to the Warburg effect. And I just want to let you know about a book that I've been diving into a lot called Tripping Over the Truth by Travis Christofferson. I highly recommend this because we know that cancer is the second leading cause of mortality here in the U.S. and presumably throughout the world. Um, we know that some of the therapies for cancer are non-specific. There are side effects. Radiation and chemo, as is talked about in this book, is sort of relegated to slash and burn in the body. It's non-specific, and there can be consequences to these treatments. So if we can better prevent cancer, that would benefit humanity, benefit you and your friends and family. So I want you to better understand a characterization of cancer and a new hallmark of cancer that has recently been delineated, and that is changes in how tumors and cancerous cells uh, derive their cellular energy to finance their unrestrained growth or proliferation, which is the defining characteristic of a cancer cell. Cancer cells and tumor cells, um, there's all sorts of different subtypes uh, of cancer within a tumor in and of itself. There's different phenotypes of cancer and, and tumors but the defining hallmark is unrestrained cellular growth. And that's why, why Otto Warburg, uh, what, what he first characterized in the 1920s was that, hey, these cancerous cells, they're financing this unrestrained growth by using energy differently. Even in the presence of oxygen, normal cells, what they will do is they will extract uh, energy from carbohydrates and fats to aerobically break down those macronutrients to create ATP, cellular energy. But what's different about tumor cells and cancerous cells is in the presence of oxygen, they will ferment glucose to make pyruvate and lactate. And that lactate is used as, as a signaling molecule to further help the tumor evade tumor suppressor proteins and so forth, evade apoptosis and invade other tissues. And so that is one of the hallmarks, uh, again, specifically referring to colon, breast, lung, and brain cancer, and maybe pancreatic cancer is a paper that we're going to talk about today, dives further into. So what we need to understand here, I think the big question in 2023 with regards to revisiting this Warburg effect is this, is it the genetic expression changes and the DNA mutations that are characteristic of cancer causing this change in metabolism? Or is it the latter? What's the chicken or the egg? Or is it the change in metabolism and mitochondrial function causing the change in gene expression that is leading to tumor formation? And I think there's two schools of camps um, that will argue and debate within oncologic circles and so forth about what begets what. Is it the, is it the DNA damage? Obviously, DNA damage is a, is a problem, right? But when there's DNA damage, is that causing the change in metabolism or is it the latter? Is it the change in metabolism that is changing gene expression? And either way, um, I think we can benefit by being more metabolically healthy. And that's what I want to share with you in today's session and talk more about the importance of the mitochondria because the mitochondria, your cellular organelles that help you create cellular energy, they are involved in regulating apoptosis or pre-programmed cell death. And that is sort of, there's a dearth of apoptosis in tumor cells. They don't know when to die. So they keep growing and dividing and growing. And that is the problem. So dysregulated mitochondrial functioning is a problem. And in 2011, there was an interesting paper that talked a little bit more about this, and this confirms the latter hypothesis that I was referring to, and that is that deranged metabolism may foster a tumor microenvironment and create a, a, a tumor or neoplastic condition. Uh, a paper by Schultz et al. in 2011 found that when cancerous cells were given frutaxin, which is a, natural, a naturally occurring compound in your body that helps to foster mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, the normal way that cells would create cellular energy, that it had an inhibition effect on tumorogenesis in the formation of cancerous cells uh, and slowed growth. And so this is just one of uh, many recently published studies that helps to confirm or support the thesis created by Otto Warburg in 1920. And that is that cancerous cells will aerobically ferment glucose in the presence of oxygen. So a few different papers that I want to share with you here on the screen. Uh, this one titled Warburg Effect in Colorectal Cancer, the Emerging Roles in Tumor Microenvironment and Therapeutic Implications. And again, this paper is talking specifically about colon cancer, but in this paper, they do talk about how the Warburg effect is prevalent and has implications in tumors and in, in brain cancer, 
lung cancer. I mentioned breast cancer as well as colon cancer. And there was a new paper, this was December of 2022, glucose metabolism and tumor microenvironment in pancreatic cancer, a link in cancer progression. And so a lot of papers are finding that there's this dysregulated glucose metabolism and that is fostering a tumor microenvironment that favors expansive growth. And I, I really want to hone in to the mechanisms here and, and give you some evidence that would link uh, healthy dietary changes and exercise and all the strategies that we've talked about on this channel with supporting a microenvironment that doesn't favor tumor growth and expansion and talk about the PET scan positron emission tomography. This is a diagnostic imaging tool that's widely used all throughout the world that uses a radioisotoped glucose known as fluorodeoxyglucose, FDG, that helps to diagnose cancer. Now, you might be thinking, well, how does that help support the whole Warburg effect? Well, it turns out that when individual subjects that maybe have cancer biomarkers, uh, say CA125, CA18 that are elevated, or they might have lumps in their breast, or they might have cognitive decline or something, or memory loss or vision changes that might suggest a glioblastoma or something or tumor in the brain, they will get this imaging to see how big the tumor is and where this tumor might be. And again, they are using a radioisotope labeled a fluorodeoxyglucose to actually see because tumor cells are highly glucose dependent in, in terms of their, you know, like we talked about how they change their microenvironment and their metabolism to really thrive off glucose oxidation. So this is the imaging the PET scan, this is widely used for people with cancer to see if the you know radiation or the chemo is actually being effect, it's, it's effective and affecting those tumors or if the, if the cancer has spread. So isn't it quite interesting that we're using a technology that is ascertaining the glucose demand in a tumor subtype as a diagnostic imaging tool? And so I think that that does favor if you will, the, the thesis that Otto Warburg presented in the 1920s. And there's also evidence about metformin. A lot of people in oncologic circles are looking at metformin as a tool. We know metformin is a diabe diabetic drug. It helps support insulin sensitivity and increasing glucagon sensitivity and the like and decreasing glucose. Well, it's now being repurposed in cancer treatment and therapeutics. And so we have a lot of evidence to suggest that this deranged cellular metabolism that is now a new hallmark of cancer, we don't know if it's the chicken or the egg, but either way, we should be focusing on supporting metabolic health. And so I wanna continue and talk more about the tumor microenvironment and new research with regards to the Warburg effect. But as always, friends, I wanna thank you for being here. Thanks for hitting that like button. If you're enjoying this content and the references in the show notes, please hit that like button. Be sure to leave a comment below and let me know what you think about these science-based updates. And since we're talking about metabolic health, I wanna let you know about a naturally occurring compound called berberine hydrochloride. This is a very effective strategy to help support metabolic health, help support your intermittent fasting lifestyle. Um, it's a great tool. If you take two to three capsules after your last meal, 30 to 40 minutes, it can help kickstart or accelerate the fasting physiology. And I just want to share with you two recently published reviews over at myoscience.com. June wrote, Berberine fasting accelerator decreases my food cravings in the evening. I take three to four capsules 45 minutes after I eat and haven't noticed any side effects. Jesse recently wrote, uh, this is a, a great tool for supporting metabolic health. You can see it working in real time with a continuous glucose monitor. That's all the proof I needed. So you can save on Berberine Fasting Accelerator over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Myoscience with an X. Use the code podcast to save. So let's specifically, this I think is really important, talking about how would a tumor benefit from this Warburg effect and this fermentation of glucose. Like what exactly mechanistically is going on that, that, that glucose or sugar and, and having high glycemia, uh, high hyperglycemia and glycemic variability, how does that foster a tumor microenvironment? Well, it turns out that it helps evade apopto apoptosis, as I mentioned. So when you're, when you're fermenting glucose, uh, you're creating lactate, lactate, lactic acid. And lactic acid is the burn that you feel in your muscles when you're doing high intensity interval training or sprints or weightlifting and things like that, that burn. Well, it turns out that lactate is also a signaling molecule. There's been many recently published papers about lactate as a signaling molecule. Now, I wanna just pause here because some people are gonna say, well, if lactate is involved in cancer, then it isn't exercise bad. Exercise is a transient acute increase in lactate. 
in a growing tumor, it would be a chronic overexpression of lactate. We need to differentiate and, and mentally parse out the differences between acute inflammation, chronic inflammation, acute cortisol release, chronic cortisol. In this case, acute lactate increase from exercise healthy, chronic lactate release from a growing tumor bad because essentially what lactate does and this gets a little complex. I promise this is as deep as we're going to go in terms of the nutritional biochemistry. But lactate can increase a key signaling factor known as hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. HIF 1-alpha, actually, it's also involved as you gain more body fat. Your fat cells become hypoxic. They release HIF 1-alpha. And HIF 1-alpha triggers the release one more big word here, and then we're done with big words, uh, VEGF, and that's vascular endothelial growth factor. And VEGF helps in, in the context of tumors revascularize the environment. So the growing tumor, it can help then metastasize and invade other tissues. It needs nutrients, amino acids, glutamine, glucose. Uh, and so the lactate signaling is maladaptive in the tumor insofar as it helps the tumor grow more blood vessels. And this is why there's a huge push in oncology for VEGF inhibitors to prevent this, to block off, to sort of cut off the fuel supply to the rapidly growing tumor. So lactate is a favorable signaling molecule, and that's why the tumors have been shown to reprogram their cellular metabolism to pivot away from mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, the healthy way of creating cellular energy, favoring this really inefficient way of deriving cellular energy by fermenting glucose, creating lactate. And that's point number one. Point number two is that when you take the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation derived pathway of energy creation out of the picture, you also inhibit the mitochondrial's ability to induce apoptosis, like I mentioned earlier, also known as pre-programmed cell death. So there's the two kind of mechanistic ways, and there's others, but this, these are the two big ones that scientists have, have talked about recently, supporting Warburg's thesis as a means by which cancer cells benefit from metabolically altering their metabolism. And, and so those are the big ones. Again, lactic acid signaling, inducing HIF-1-alpha, increasing the vascularization of the tumor so that the tumor can get more nutrients and grow, grow, grow. And number two, inhibiting apoptosis. And so let's just back up and summarize what we've talked about so far. We know that cancer cells reprogram their metabolism. We know that the diagnostic imaging tool used to ascertain tumor size and growth and whether or not um, oncologic drugs, radiation treatment, surgery has been effective is using the PET scan. The PET scan is radioisotoped glucose to see if a highly energetically demanding tissue like a growing tumor has shrunk or, or gotten bigger, right? So there's a lot of evidence to link sugar and deranged sugar metabolism to, to uh, tumor growth. And we also now know that the mechanistic ways um, that fermenting glucose favors tumor microenvironment. And so this leads us then to a major theme that we all need to be aware of. And it sort of ties in with this terrain theory that we talked a lot about with COVID-19. You know, a lot of people think it's all about the virus. We have to, we cannot get exposed to the virus because the virus is a problem. A lot of us said, well, it's actually the terrain, the host terrain. The healthier your terrain is, you should be able to tolerate exposure to pathogens, especially this one, because it turns out that this SARS-CoV-2 isn't that bad for people that are metabolically healthy. Um, and so the same sort of analogy can be made for the tumor microenvironment. And that is that the, the environment in these tissues, in your breast, in your lung, in your colon specifically, pancreas, in the brain, the microenvironment there uh, can foster or inhibit the growth of a tumor. And this is what's really getting a lot of attention here is the tumor microenvironment. And that's where, of course, preventative strategies come in. And that's why it's so exciting. And so the past uh, decade or two, uh, various scientists have really started to hone in on the tumor microenvironment and the importance of diet as a cancer preventative tool. A lot of people are focused on, well, what is an anti-cancer diet? Well, based upon the information that I presented here and based upon this 100, more than 100 year old theory called the Warburg effect, it would suggest that most people should not overconsume carbohydrates, should match their carbohydrate intake with their exercise output. Sedentary people do not need to be eating bread, pasta, bagels every single meal. Possibly a lower carb diet, higher protein diet, um, a, a diet that is favoring mitochondrial breakdown and derivation of energy, uh, exercising, having normal glycemic variability and, and walking after meals and not over consuming meals during meal time, focusing on circadian rhythm health. And also, I think this is where 
uh, it gets kind of controversial because uh, we don't have evidence to suggest this, but focusing on cold immersions. We know cold immersions are in, in many ways a mitochondrial therapy because it helps to induce uncoupling in the mitochondria, particularly in brown fat and other parts of the body. Um, you know, the, the cold immersions help to redistribute lymph and, and stagnant lymph is linked with cancer and inflammation. So I also think that is a lifestyle modality to help to support a microenvironment that is maladaptive for tumor growth and expansion. Uh, I think cold plunges are just another tool uh, that can we can implement in addition to the exercise and low glycemic index diet, intermittent fasting, uh, and circadian rhythm optimization. So I think that's uh, really important. And we actually have some pretty good evidence from the NHANES data set. This was a, a paper in 2014 titled Nutrition and Physical Activity cancer prevention guidelines, cancer risk and mortality in the Women's Health Initiative study. Now, essentially what this paper found is that there's an association with a lower risk for breast cancer, total cancers, and colorectal cancers for people who follow dietary guidelines prevented by the American Cancer Society. And those guidelines are minimizing sugar, minimizing fast food and processed foods and things like that. And they specifically had found a 22% lower risk of breast cancer and a 52% lower risk of colorectal cancer and a 27% lower risk of all-cause mortality and a 20% lower risk of cancer-specific mortality for people who follow these guidelines. And this was 8,000 subjects that were followed over the course of 12 years. Again, so we do have connections here. We do have this epidemiological evidence suggesting that uh, consuming less sugar and less processed foods are linked with lower incidences of the cancers that I mentioned that are more sensitive to this Warburg effect and, and are characterized by the Warburg effect. So in closing, we have imaging tools that utilize glucose as a tracer. We have diabetic drugs that have been shown to prevent cancer. We have other studies that have shown that if we foster mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, we can slow cancer growth. And now we have this epidemiological evidence to suggest that if we eat less sugar and so forth, that we might have a lower prevalence of cancer. So I think it's quite interesting, and that's why, again, I want to share this book with you, Tripping Over the Truth. I have learned so much about this. Cancer claims around 600,000 lives every year in the U.S., and it's on the rise. A lot of people, unfortunately, have uh, been diagnosed with cancer and have succumbed to cancer, and hopefully this information will give you the tools to help you better prevent cancer by making more strategic lifestyle choices in your exercise, your nutrition, your feeding fasting windows, and what you do after you eat, like walking, and maybe doing more cold plunges and things like that. So as always, I appreciate you tuning in all the way through the end. Hopefully you gathered some info from this content that was helpful, and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road. Bye now.